Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back. I hope you've had a wonderful week. I'm coming at you live, as always, from the Hudson Valley, although I'm in a different room today because it's been a little bit loud in my building. As you know, we've been discussing the legacies of colonialism. And this is a discussion that has us talking about the patterns set in motion by the institutions imposed during European colonialism. And we're thinking about long periods of time and history and the ways that patterns of development reproduce themselves. This is a, an important discussion because we're not just talking about history, uh, but also the potential or the, the possibility that, that societies can throw off those old institutions and establish new ones. We'll focus today as we did on Wednesday on some different African experiences. We'll look at examples of contemporary development outcomes that can be linked to those colonial experiences and in particular, the kinds of institutions left behind. This is a, a discussion that will have some video and some footage, but I also hope that you will uh, include yourself and be engaged and ask questions in the last couple classes, um, we've we've had a little bit more engagement, but I, I want you to feel um, free to raise your hand or comment or intervene wherever you, you'd like to do so, because as much as possible, I want this to feel like we're in class, uh, even though we've at this point become used to, to doing everything virtually. So welcome back. It's so good to see you. And I hope that we can you know, make the most of this and I hope that you will uh, engage with me as we, as we go along. So let's go ahead and get started. We're gonna go back just a little bit because I want to set the scene and remind you of where we left off. Remember that we were discussing the case of the Democratic Republic of Congo or the Congo Free State, excuse me, and we talked about how the Belgian colonizer, and especially under King Leopold II, established what was essentially um, a set of extractive institutions that, that, that ultimately came down to being a private estate or just a sort of piggy bank, if you will, for, for King Leopold, and really more accurately, uh, uh, an extractive state that, that was taken for all that it was worth. And, this period between 1895 and 1908 saw the most extensive extractivism. And today, the most contemporary research shows that when you compare social, economic, and political development inside and outside of the historical concessionary boundaries, you discover that the reign of King Leopold II and the pattern set in motion at that time can be connected to lower literacy, schooling and health outcomes, more authoritarian chiefs who are less likely to be elected by the community and are more likely to uh, remain in, in, in power beyond a term that might have been set up for them. And then also worse public goods provision in the sense that states are weaker and the the DRC is a very weak state incapable of, of providing the most basic public goods like education and, and, and communications or, or, or security. And this is a good example of using a kind of natural experiment to tease out the impact of a particular set of institutions imposed during this period of, of colonial rule. You might ask questions about how certain we can be that King Leopold II's reign brought about these outcomes in the present because ultimately it's difficult to know how the Congo would have developed in the absence of these institutions. But one thing is for sure that there is a clear difference between literacy, schooling and health outcomes, political outcomes in, in public goods provision inside and outside of the, the concessionary boundaries. The Congo is one of the more extreme examples. And we saw in a video on Wednesday, the way that the state was set up 
to be an extractive state and to maximize profit. Let's continue that video and pick up where we left off uh, so that we can see the rest of the story. Smaller districts, each sold to a foreign private export company, such as the Anglo-Belgian India Rubber Company. To meet the demand of European shareholders, the companies utilized all means available to them, however cruel or inhumane. International buyers, such as Dunlop Rubber and Goodyear Tire, became indifferent customers of an increasingly ruthless corporate machine. The central government in Boma randomly set rubber quotas for each district, often without taking into account the available workforce or natural yield of the area. Meanwhile, villages were forced to provide workers to the companies as a form of taxation, with a refusal to do so resulting in the village's destruction as well as the mutilation of the residents. Dismembered limbs, bodies and heads were used as public displays to terrorize the locals into submission. Another routine method to encourage labor was to abduct family members and force the workers to repurchase their loved ones with rubber above the set quotas. In some cases, even where the quotas were met, workers would find that their families had been murdered regardless, while those more fortunate were shipped to Belgium to populate one of Leopold's human zoos. To minimize expenses, proper equipment was scarcely provided. Instead, at the pain of the whip, the Congolese were often made to harvest rubber with their skin. Those who refused to comply would be subject to, or were to have their families subject to, beatings, torture, rape, or execution. In the company of death, the prized possession of the free state soon earned the name Red Rubber. Modern weaponry was provided to Leopold's militia only on specific terms. All cartridges were to be accounted for, and for every cartridge expended in execution, the victim's hand was to be provided as proof of execution. Soon enough, severed hands were provided to excuse labor shortages or to shorten one's period of forced labor. The demand for dissected hands then inspired a new black market whereby villages would be raided by local officials for the harvesting of hands. Among the mercenaries of the Force Publique emerged a system of organ trading and cannibalism, cultivated in part by the free state authorities to inspire terror and obedience. For the millions of Congolese, their homeland had turned into a living nightmare. Entire communities, drained of their most able-bodied workers, ceased to exist. Villages were abandoned and a whole generation of children was left to starve. With no new generations to pass on the knowledge, the traditional systems of farming and trade that had existed for millennia across the Congo collapsed in a mere decade. Crop rotation was replaced with a network of rubber monocropping, which degraded the soil and resulted in widespread famine. With millions of refugees going about, diseases ranging from smallpox and sleeping sickness to syphilis and gonorrhea increased across the area. In some districts, dysentery and malnutrition alone would cause the deaths up to 60% of the population. The demographics of the Congo was so radically altered that Lingala, a language previously confined to the mouth of the Irubu River, emerged as a common tongue. Imagine, for instance, how drastically one must alter the demographics of France and Spain for Basque to appear as the primary language. That is essentially what happened to the African interior. Under the jackboots of the free state, the pursuit of profit had cost the lives of between 10 and 20 million Congolese, with the consensus being 10 million. The region was mutilated beyond recognition. For the free state, however, business was booming. Congolese rubber came to dominate a third of the worldwide rubber market. In 1888, during the early years of the free state, profitability was recorded at 260,000 Belgian francs. By 1905, the wealth had ballooned to 47 million francs. With this newfound wealth, King Leopold, who came to be known as the Builder King, was able to provide for urban renewal throughout Belgium. Not everyone in Europe 
pretended not to notice the atrocities taking place in the Congo Free State, but attempts to bring public attention to them were met with a well-armed propaganda machine that slandered activists into public isolation or in some cases suicide. Nonetheless, in 1908, under domestic and foreign pressure, Leopold eventually conceded his private colonial hold to the Belgian parliament. The king then spent the last years of his life destroying any evidence of the abuses of the free state. To a certain degree, it worked. For almost a century after his death, Leopold was remembered not for his brutality, but his great construction works. As for the Congo's rubber, it was eventually phased out when the compound was introduced to South and Southeast Asia. By then, the Congo became an area of irrelevance. So much so, that when the country gained independence in 1960, only 30 Congolese had graduated from university nationwide. Moreover, since the Congo had been plundered so thoroughly and its people had lost an entire generation, knowledge of traditional farming and trade was lost. The Congolese had to import most of their basic necessities. As such, the newly independent Democratic Republic of the Congo was burdened with more debt than any other African country. The lack of organization, whether in education, agriculture, or public institutions, as well as the high sum of debt, sealed the faith of the country. The years following independence were chaotic, with one secessionist war to the next. Eventually, in the 1990s, the country returned to its familiar pattern when warlords regained power amidst a series of regional conflicts. What was once red rubber became blood diamonds, and conflict minerals such as timber and cobalt. In a cruel twist of faith, the wealth of natural resources has never allowed the Congo to escape the horror of its nightmare. I've been your host, Shirvan, from Caspian Report. Special thanks. So the case of the Congo under King Leopold II shows that setting up these extractive political institutions sets in motion a pattern that can be very difficult, if not impossible, to break from because the channeling of wealth and natural resource wealth back to Belgium exclusively meant that the Congo was stuck with a focus on rubber, which eventually was phased out as something that the Congo could produce because of competition from, from East Asia. But this focus on rubber meant that it had to be replaced with something else, which eventually proved to be diamonds, but the total lack of organization and the weakness of institutions in the sort of vacuum of authority in the Congo has meant that it's a completely lawless state, more or less. We would refer to it as a failed state because of the incapacity of the state to provide public goods. And part of that, of course, is the non-existent economic growth in the collapse of the economy. It's difficult to imagine that the outcome would have been this bad in the absence of those extractive institutions set up during the reign of King Leopold II. And other examples in Africa seem to illustrate a similar pattern, even though the case of the Belgian Congo is, is extremely um, pronounced in its, its viciousness and just how extractive the system was. But you get a good sense then of what kinds of patterns are set in motion by these experiences with, with European colonialism. Another example is the example of Sierra Leone. And Sierra Leone is different from the Congo because the Congo was, was under Belgian rule. Sierra Leone was under British rule. Remember that British rule was often associated with settler colonies. And a British colonial legacy has often been associated with with economic growth and better development outcomes. But in Sierra Leone, that hasn't been the case at all. And in fact, much of the story of Sierra Leone is, is one of the abuse of power by political actors appointed by, by the crown. And between the period of 1896 and 1903, British appointed chiefs in particular ruled with violence and depression they reported only to the colonial power. 
They didn't answer to anyone local um, and they ruled in a ruthless and vicious and violent way. And it wasn't just that during this period of, of British rule, British control that, that Sierra Leone was subject to, to violence and oppression and authoritarianism. In fact, even after independence, the power of the chiefs expanded. And the reason is because the state of Sierra Leone was very weak and unable to broadcast power throughout the countryside. A lasting civil conflict between different civilian groups also weakened the state and meant that those power brokers, those local chiefs were, were disproportionately empowered as a result of the, the tensions between those groups and the need for leadership in those circumstances. And these chiefs, despite independence, were likely to remain in power um, even if they weren't elected and were likely to abuse their power. Generally speaking, the endurance and the survival of authoritarianism meant that Sierra Leone was never able to initiate a transition or a movement towards, towards democracy. And so this can be linked to the, the colonial period. And more specifically, these chiefs, these local chiefs, they control land, they settle disputes, they tax production, they provide goods, public goods that is, that the state otherwise would provide if the state wasn't as weak as it was. And they supply votes in national elections to political parties or to candidates. And so the British colonial legacy in Sierra Leone is not necessarily positive. It's, it's, it's an undemocratic, illiberal legacy that has been virtually impossible to break from. And this is the case despite uh, not being landlocked and despite not having as difficult a time as say a country like Uganda uh, or Burundi. And we'll talk in a moment about how being landlocked presents a, a different set of challenges that can be equally difficult to overcome. And so when you put together the different pieces of the puzzle, the colonial experience was, was overwhelmingly negative including in those cases where the British or, or other more liberal colonizers uh, set up institutions. Brady says, I cannot believe that there was such a thing as a human zoo. Yeah, it's really uh, it, incredible. Um, and it goes to the mindset, you know, we, I think, forget sometimes that colonialism was rooted in this, this view of, of this, this view of, of, in, of indigenous and native people as, as subhuman, right? As subhuman and as, as not just inferior, but as subhuman. And that helped to sustain slavery and that helped to sustain and legitimate imperialism. And it helped to, to kind of give credibility to what was obviously itself subhuman. And, and, and that is the, the systems imposed by the colonial powers. And so the Belgian case is an extreme case, but it's one that still captures part of every experience with colonialism, which is the brutality in that view of, of the natives and the indigenous as subhuman. And even in those cases where the British set up settler colonies, they did so precisely because these were places that were unsettled or were peopled primarily by ancient or indigenous or native civilizations that were viewed as, as inferior or as, or as subhuman. And this is why this is why those indigenous and those native populations were virtually always the, the target of, of the, the colonial power. And there was this need to reduce them or subjugate them or eliminate them or, or you know, bring them into systems of slavery and forced labor. And so, yeah, it's incredible. And I think that, I think that uh, it's easy to forget that this, this isn't an, ac an academic exercise. We're not just discussing concepts. We're talking about you know, something that truly was subhuman. And so we're, we do our best to try to capture that. And so sometimes the video footage of the documentaries that I show
do a better job of that than I can because these are relatively well produced and and uh, that gives you an insight that that goes to the core of the nature of colonialism and really the essence of these extractive institutions, if you will. Now, any discussion of colonialism and its legacy would be incomplete without talking about some of the potential benefits of colonialism and let's be nuanced and sophisticated in our assessment here. It is true that colonial powers frequently undertook major investments in infrastructure or transportation and they primarily did so because they wanted to set up routes and transportation networks that could funnel and channel those those revenues and those resources and those commodities back to the mother country right they they set places up to maximize profit and for optimal profit generation in pursuit of that mercantilist policy that meant all the action was between the colony and the mother country this usually meant railroads and road investments Cecil Rhodes, for example, believed that in Africa, railroad and road investments could transform the continent and could be a difference maker. And it is true that the most contemporary research shows that in 44 countries, including in case studies of Ghana and Kenya, local development benefited from proximity to colonial railroads and in particular there are higher levels of, of economic development and growth in areas that are close to those colonial infrastructure networks that were set up during the period of, of African colonization. But the problem is, and this is a, a big asterisk, the problem is that those investments were very, very limited. It was not the norm to set up extensive railroad and road networks more often, the focus was on setting up networks that could benefit the colonial power and not necessarily benefit the development of, of that actual country or, or present day country. And I'll give you an example. The example of Mozambique is a good one because this is a colony that was larger than France. France was of course the colonial power but despite being larger than France, it only had three main and two subordinate railway lines. And those are pictured here in the graphic on the, on the left. And these connected the ports of Lorenco Marquis, Berra and Nicala to the interior of the country. Now the objective in Mozambique was to ship minerals, agricultural goods to Europe and the Americas. At this time, there was a focus on obtaining a larger and larger market share for those minerals, agricultural goods, of course, under the control of the French colonial power. And so anything that was shipped to those markets benefited France. Of course, this meant that there was a wholesale neglect of the links between the southern and central and northern provinces. The country was actually effectively split into three zones and still today is split into three zones. The, the focus of the colonizers, the French colonial power was to set the territory up and the, the communications and, and transportation networks up to, to ship those minerals and, and goods back to, to Europe. And so this is what the country is left with today. And the most recent update is that the government is working on expanding railway lines, but the state is relatively weak and has had to rely a great deal on the private sector to jumpstart the development of, of new railway, railway lines. And part of this effort has involved restoring and harnessing those old existing colonial rail lines. But the point of this case study is that even today, Mozambique is basically still stuck 
with the same railway lines, the ones put in place during colonization. And it, it gives you a good example of how institutions and policies and practices set up during that period endures to this day, um, despite their relatively irrational logic in the way that they don't actually complement the development of the country. And so you can see that between the period of, of 1890 and 1960, which is the, the very tail end of the, the pre-independence period, a number of different rail lines were constructed, but all of these essentially cut the country into thirds uh, that have no connection to each other and that, that don't actually facilitate or promote development or, or exchange or trade within the country in a way that, that might be more conducive to long-term growth. Of course, one of the consequences of colonialism that may be more pronounced than, than any is the way that the colonizers drew up artificial boundaries and artificial borders. When European colonial powers scrambled for Africa or set out to colonize and appropriate the territory, they worked together to draw what were essentially artificial boundaries and borders that had no regard for cultural or historical or political differences between tribes or groups. And the main concern was to not fight each other on African soil. Remember that the European colonial powers were ruling these places indirectly. They were setting up institutions and systems to establish control, but from a distance. And so in the case of Latin America, Spain set up those viceroys, as we saw, those, vicero those viceroyalties. In the case of Africa, the colonial power always set up systems of indirect rule. And so part of this was the drawing of artificial boundaries or borders that they would respect from a distance and that would permit them to, to not fight each other. And so British Prime Minister Lord Stalisbury said the following about this process of, of drawing borders artificially. We are engaged in drawing lines upon maps where no white man's feet have ever trod. We have been giving away mountains and rivers and lakes to each other, only hindered by the small impediment that we never knew where the mountains, rivers, and lakes actually were. And so the main consideration, the main priority is to not fight each other. It's not to obey or respect the actual cultural historical differences that, that might exist between groups. Can you imagine what some of the consequences of this might be? Why is it problematic just on the face of it to just sort of draw borders or boundaries artificially. What's the problem with drawing borders just kind of arbitrarily or artificially? How can that affect development? Rady says some groups hated each other. Putting them together would only cause chaos. So yeah, in a basic sense, it obviously could stoke conflict. If you ignore these differences and you bring groups together under the auspices of a colonial set of boundaries and, and then maybe just ignore those when it comes to independence and withdrawing from the region. Any other ideas about how the scramble for Africa may have impacted the long-term prospects for development? Victor says it can also separate groups from one border to another. Absolutely, so 
in addition to bringing groups together that might be in conflict, you can separate groups. And in doing so, you can, you can really lose some of the potential benefits from keeping them together, right? If, if keeping them together could promote growth or solidarity or cooperation or trust, which is a building block of, of economic growth, social trust. Karen says it would be hard to take ownership of precise locations around these borders. And so you're creating this kind of territorial division that might complicate uh, the nation building process. Walter says it's like putting a label on something that doesn't even exist. Yeah, so, you know, in politics, in society, the concept of a nation matters a great deal because it's a social construct or a, a psychological construct, the idea that people share about their identity or what they, what relation to each other they bear. And so when you just put an arbitrary label on, on people who might not share any sense of solidarity, um, if it doesn't actually exist, well, how is it going to function as a whole if it doesn't really exist? So there are all sorts of problems you can imagine. And the scramble for Africa was, was problematic for a lot of the reasons that, that many of you have already mentioned. And, and Rady adds one more, you know, they were distributing land they didn't even know. What about local forms of governments? Yeah, absolutely. What about, you know, existing titles or existing uh, claims to these lands or territories? The legacies of the scramble for Africa are, are also problematic, as you can imagine. And, and one of the biggest ones is that it resulted in the creation of a huge number of landlocked countries. Africa has the largest proportion of landlocked countries of any continent in the world. Now you remember independence in Latin America was a more drawn out process. And it was a process that did involve artificial boundary drawing, but the process of nation and state building in Latin America was very drawn out and took about 50 to 100 years. And it was a period during which a lot of those borders and boundaries were, were sort of reconfigured by Latin Americans themselves in the period after colonialism. So Latin America wound up with a set of boundaries that were a little bit different and a little bit more sort of rational, so to speak, than those boundaries in Africa. In Africa, there was no sorting process after independence. And in fact, the same boundaries and, and borders remained in place, the ones drawn by the colonizers. As a result, Africa has more landlocked countries of, of any continent in the world. Countries like Niger, Chad, Chad, Burkina Faso, the Central African Republic, Rwanda, Burundi, Uganda, they're all landlocked. And what that means is that their access to world markets depends on trade and shipping routes through war prone, unstable regions in neighbors. And those war prone and unstable neighbors are war prone and unstable precisely because often because of those artificial borders and boundaries. And so not just countries being landlocked, but the war prone and unstable neighbors they have to go through to get to world markets all of this is due to how arbitrary and artificial those boundaries were in the first place. And so the structure and the distribution of power and the, the territorial arrangement of, of Africa is related to colonialism. And this, this sort of parcelization and the fragmentation of Africa is also in turn related to development because it affects access to markets, it locks countries within the continent without access to, to waterways. A second big issue is that the scramble for Africa meant that states were, were very, very weak from the very beginning. The size of these countries was often quite large. The geography was often very diverse and varied internally because artificial boundaries meant that there was no logic or rhyme or reason to the geography and the the topography of the, of the territories. As a result, and because of those limited infrastructure investments, the limited capacity of the state, states could not broadcast power 
across the territory and it became very difficult to consolidate that capacity to monopolize vi violence that we associate with the state. States then were very, very weak. Central governments could not establish control. And to this day, Africa has tons and tons of weak and failed states that aren't able to end conflicts or internal rebellions. These in turn have very disastrous consequences for the economy. And it's a very vicious cycle that tends to feed on itself. And in the Congo, as elsewhere, uh, state weakness and state failure have meant that criminal groups and, and all sorts of, of just terrible practices persist and economies have not been developed. They remain uh, largely illicit or informal. Um, and it's just a really bad situation that hasn't improved or contributed to human development. And then finally, there's the, the fact that ethnic partitioning has resulted in the division of groups across borders. It's resulted in the division of homelands into separate units and in, in, in separate parcels. And it's meant that social trust has broken down and groups have been split up. And it's meant that there's, again, there's no rhyme or reason to the organization of societies. And this fragmentation has meant conflict and disorder. And oftentimes it has helped to contribute to the state weakness through civil conflict, through disorder. Um, and in general, it's, it's, a, it's an aspect of, of African societies that has made them prone to conflict. And so even in situations where they've tried to set up institutions that can help to mitigate ethnic partitioning, they sometimes wind up with more conflict than ever. So for example, ethnic party systems and consensual democracies that are designed to give seats to, to certain groups can sometimes become more explosive than ever because they, they institutionalize and they reinforce cleavages. All of these things put together have been very, very harmful for Africa. And it's been difficult to break the patterns set in motion by, by those original colonial institutions. And those institutions included these artificial boundaries that, that we associate with the scramble for Africa. And so take a look at these figures. We see on the left, ethnic homelands and national borders. And so the blue are partitioned groups. The white are non-partitioned groups and national boundaries are in gray. And so what you can see is that national boundaries do not at all correspond to groups. What you see is a lot of partitioning. In most cases, groups are split across boundaries and split up into multiple pieces that are cut up by, by those national boundaries. And if you actually compare the national boundaries to violent events, and if you represent violent events like battles, riots or protests and violence against civilians, you find that violent events tend to be disproportionately frequent in areas where groups were partitioned or where ethnic homelands were partitioned. And the most contemporary research seems to suggest, if not show pretty persuasively, that these violent events and this ethnic conflict is, is, is caused by or is closely associated with, with ethnic partitioning and, and ethnic divisions. And, and the division of ethnic groups in the partitioning of them across borders. This seems to suggest then that ethnic conflict is related to, to colonial institutions and the, the institutions and the, the boundaries and the borders laid down a long time ago during that period with European colonialism. You know, on the face of it, many people might doubt or be suspicious of the claim that European colonialism explains conflict and underdevelopment today. But if you look at information and evidence like this, and if you think about the ways that institutions incentivize certain behavior and, 
distribute power in certain ways, it begins to make more sense that there could be a link between European colonialism and present day underdevelopment and conflict and in, in slow or, or relative underdevelopment when it comes to human development. Before we continue, uh, does anyone have any comments or questions about ethnic partitioning, European colonialism and underdevelopment? It's another way we can look at this. You can look at ethnic partitioning in civil conflict by comparing the conflict in partitioned ethnic homelands and the conflict in non-split ethnic homelands. And what you see is that in, in all instances, conflict is more frequent and higher in partitioned homelands represented here in the black. It's lower in the non-split or the non-partitioned homelands represented here in the green. Any discussion of the legacies of colonialism is, is obviously incomplete without discussing the slave trades. And at this point, I'd like to incorporate the reading for this week. Now, as you know, we completed a reading by Samuel Nunn. And Samuel Nunn is concerned with the consequences of the slave trades in Africa. What is the main finding in the Samuel Nunn piece about the consequences of the slave trades in Africa. Any takers? So Karen points out, uh, countries who opted into slavery tended to be less developed today. Yeah, that's that's more or less the the finding, and 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 really to to put it a little bit more um, a little differently, what Nunn finds is that economic economic development is lower in those areas that were most affected by the, the slave trades. And none is looking at data regarding shipments of slaves and linking that to growth rates. And in a very, very compelling way, he shows that places that were most affected by the slave trades are less developed economically today in the contemporary period. And so he's drawing a link between the African slave trades that took place between 1400 and 1900 and contemporary economic development outcomes. Now the African slave trades lasted about 500 years and there were four of them. There was the transatlantic slave trade, which saw 12 million slaves primarily shipped to the Americas. There was the East Africa slave trade, the Red Sea slave trade, and the Trans-Saharan slave trade. And slave trades two to four, the East Africa, the Red Sea, and the Trans-Saharan totaled about 8 million slaves compared to the 12 million of the transatlantic. These four slave trades constituted the, the primary markets or the primary trade of of slaves during this, this period. And you can take a look at the intensity of the slave trade at the country level. And you see that some areas of present day Africa are more represented in the slave trades than others. And, and so these darker areas 
had the most intense involvement in the slave trades as as represented by the the number of slaves or the proportion of the population that that, that was enslaved and the legacies of the slave trade are our main focus here and as none finds countries most affected by the slave trade are the ones that are less economically developed today. And although in that article, none doesn't explain why exactly that's the case, there is a lot of subsequent research that shows the links between involvement in the slave trade and lower economic development today. And those links are as follows. In the first place, countries that were more affected by enslavement have higher levels of distrust. That's important because we know that trust is a building block of cooperative activity and economic activity is cooperative activity. Higher levels of distrust brings down economic development. The second mechanism was the alteration of the sex ratio. Slaves were of course disproportionately men. And so that meant that with fewer men, more men would take more female partners. In that practice, polygyny leads to, leads to the spread of HIV and the spread of HIV resulted in underinvestments in education. This is another set of links between involvement in the slave trade and lower economic development today. The third mechanism is the fact that educational attainment is lower among those ethnic groups that are most affected. And this is understandable from the, the perspective that those groups most affected would have fewer resources and would, would bear the sort of residual cost of, of slavery and, and less capable or less able to, to obtain those new skills when, when educational attainment is, is, is only reached through one's own personal investment as a result of, of underinvestment by the state. And then four, there's the, the simple fact that slave exports correlate with contemporary conflict and authoritarianism. So places that were more involved in the slave trade have higher levels of conflict today and are more likely to be ruled by leaders that are unelected <clears throat> or who have stayed in power beyond a, a constitutional term. These are all links between involvement in the slave trade and contemporary underdevelopment. And there, of course, may very well be more, but these are the, the different reasons that the slave trades have, have undermined economic development. And this is the data from the Samuel Nunn piece. And you'll see that when you, when you analyze the relationship between GDP per capita, over time in slave exports, you find that countries that exported more slaves have a lower income per person or a lower GDP per capita. Countries that exported fewer slaves have a higher GDP per capita. In the relationship, although it is not perfect, uh, is relatively clear the direction of the relationship. This is relatively persuasive. This suggests that there is in fact a relationship between slave trades and, and economic development. Uh, listen, everybody, we're out of time for today. And um, this more or less does conclude our lecture. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I hope you have a wonderful weekend and I'll see you on Monday. <laughs>